What's up everybody, welcome to another episode of China Update, where I provide you guys with the most up-to-date political, economic and geostrategic analysis on the world's number two economy. My name is Tony, let's jump in. Okay, happy Wednesday everybody, I hope you're all doing well. Just a quick heads up before we jump in. Because of local COVID restrictions introduced today in my city, which have proven to be quite disruptive, today's video is going to be a little bit shorter than usual. I still believe that I can continue getting uh, videos out every day um, going forward though, so uh, there should still be uh, daily videos Monday through Saturday. Okay, first up, uh, Chinese economic and financial developments, and we're going to look at two major economic developments from the last day or so. First, we now have more granular details of China's Q1 economic performance. And with these details, we can really see how disruptive restrictions can be to local economies in the country, even before lockdowns are even implemented. So let's look first at Shanghai. Shanghai is a major driver of the national economy. We know this, though it only represents 4% of Chinese GDP by itself. This is in uh, 2021, um, sitting as a financial and logistics and manufacturing hub of the Yangtze River Delta. It is far more important. The Yangtze River Delta represents over 20% of national GDP. Uh, Shanghai's GDP grew officially 3.1% year on year in the first quarter. This is well below the 4.8% national average. And we remember, of course, that uh, Q1 is January through March, and Shanghai's lockdown did not start uh, in earnest until April. Uh, we have been following economic developments closely for months now, and our guess would be that growth was stable in the first two months before plunging in March. And indeed, this is what uh, the Shanghai Statistics Bureau expressed in a press statement with the release of the data. Quote, from January to February, the city's economic operation was stable overall. However, due to the impact of the sudden COVID outbreak in March, the growth rates of some economic indicators dropped significantly. End quote. Significantly is the right word. We remember that when we explored the national official data two weeks ago, we noticed that national uh, retail sales, which is an excellent proxy that we use when thinking about household consumption, dropped 3.5% in March. Well, in Shanghai, in March, retail sales collapsed an incredible 18.9% year on year. It's clear then that as restrictions were being introduced in Shanghai and cases grew, Shanghai households and residents anticipating disruptions and the risk of lockdowns dramatically reduced spending. Of course, economic activity in Shanghai in the month of April is going to be much, much worse. We've also seen poor Q1 economic performances in other localities due to partial lockdowns. Tianjin and Guangdong, for example, saw a GDP growth of 0.1% and 3.3% year-on-year, respectively, well below the national average. Okay, now the second development, and the second development is big. China analysts argue that a massive new infrastructure investment program is coming for the country. After the publication of the official readout of the 11th meeting of the Central Committee for Finance and Economic Affairs, which was held yesterday, Tuesday. Quote, it appears the leadership is going to use the growing negative economic pressures and the intensifying focus on comprehensive national security to supercharge even more construction of modern infrastructure. The targeted areas would make a dream wish list for any country. No investment amount has been disclosed. Private capital will be encouraged to participate. End quote. The above-mentioned 11th meeting of the Central Committee for Financial and Economic Affairs, chaired by General Secretary Xi Jinping himself, identified a very, very long list of projects to be built, including information science and technology, logistics, and a new generation of supercomputing, cloud computing, artificial intelligence platforms, broadband infrastructure, and other facilities, the construction of major scientific and technological infrastructure, comprehensive transportation hubs and collection and distribution systems, regional airports, general airports, and freight airports, urban infrastructure, high-quality living space, intercity railway networks, urban and suburban railways, and urban rail transit, underground utility tunnels, urban flood control and drainage, sewerage and garbage collection and treatment systems, public health emergency facilities, intelligent roads, intelligent 
intelligent power supplies, and intelligent public transportation, agricultural and rural infrastructure, farmland water facilities, high standard farmland and rural transportation systems, urban and rural cold chain logistics facilities, water supply projects, rural sewerage and garbage collection, and agricultural and rural modernization, natural water networks, the modernization of key water sources, irrigation areas and flood storage facilities, new green and low carbon energy bases, and improvements to oil and gas pipelines. So, a lot of stuff. Plus, one more thing. Quote, The construction of national security infrastructure and the acceleration of improvements to our ability to deal with extreme situations. End quote. Extreme situations is not defined in the documents, however. So it's official. After flirting with moderate fiscal responses to serious economic headwinds this year, it looks like Beijing is going all in on a very large, a substantial uh, infrastructure splurge, a nuclear option that Beijing turned to during the global financial crisis of 08 and 09, and that many have warned that this time Beijing should try to avoid. We will be exploring this move and the developments for this infrastructure spending package later this week. As always, guys, if you enjoy the content, don't forget to hit the like button. And for anybody who wants to go the extra mile, uh, Patreon, buy me a coffee, and crypto links are in the description below. As always, thank you so much, everybody, for all the support. On Tuesday, yesterday, in Pakistan, a suspected female suicide bomber killed four people in an attack near the Confucius Institute at Karachi University. Three of the victims were Chinese nationals, including the director of the Confucius Institute. The fourth victim was Pakistani. A separatist group, the Balok Liberation Army, BLA, based in southwestern Balochistan province, bordering Afghanistan and Iraq, claim responsibility for the attack. My apologies in advance for any uh, pronunciation errors. Gwadar city is in Balochistan, which houses a deep water port which Beijing is developing under the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, CPAC project, itself part of the ambitious Belt and Road Initiative. In a special statement, a People's Republic of China foreign ministry spokesperson expressed, quote, condemnation and indignation, in quote, over the attack, and said that China's assistant minister of foreign affairs, quote, made an urgent phone call to the Pakistani ambassador to China to express extremely grave concern. He demanded that the Pakistani side should immediately make thorough investigation of the incident, apprehend and punish the perpetrators to the full extent of the law, and take all possible measures to ensure the safety of Chinese citizens in Pakistan and prevent such incidents from happening again. End quote. The foreign ministry spokesperson also expressed, quote, the blood of the Chinese people should never be shed in vain. The attack is another reminder that China faces local risks for personnel and for assets as it expands its presence in regions of South Asia and the Middle East. We remember that in July last year, a suicide bomber blew up a passenger bus in northern uh, Pakistan, killing 13 people, including nine Chinese nationals working on a hydropower plant in the region. The attacks are also a political issue for Beijing too. On the one hand, it must protect Chinese people and interests overseas, and with this attack it appears that Chinese nationals may well have intentionally been targeted. On the other hand, as a means of counterbalancing India and South Asia, Pakistan is China's closest friend, officially, in the region, and one of its very few allies. Managing crises like this, which may well increase in the future, is very much a balancing trick, both diplomatically and political for Beijing. Hey guys, I'd love to hear what you thought about some of the updates we covered in today's episode, so throw your comments below. Always love hearing from you. Thank you for watching. I'll see you next time.